Hey everyone, it's Jeff and welcome back to the podcast. I um, hope your Sunday is going very well. Guys, I had a fantastic Saturday, by the way, because it was pretty much just watching NBA playoff games and also um, studying for my midterm on Monday. So overall, really productive day. Also had a ton of fun watching basketball, right? So awesome day for me. Anyways, and of course, um, the highlight of that day was definitely Minnesota versus Memphis for me. And man, you know, I have a ton of thoughts on that series. Um, by the way, if you're listening on YouTube, like and subscribe. If you're on Spotify or iTunes or Google Podcasts now, because I finally did get my podcast on that platform. Also give me a follow over there. Um, rate my podcast, I guess. Five stars. Um, helps out a lot, at least. I appreciate y'all. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, anyways, so Memphis versus Minnesota, right? I have a lot of thoughts on this because, oh, first of all, the Timberwolves, they won 130 to 117. And obviously upset 7 seed versus a 2 seed, right? You had a really great performance from Anthony Edwards, who was fantastic in both the play-in must-win game versus the Clippers, as well as scoring 34 points uh, tonight, which is, you know, I think it's the third most points scored by an NBA player in his uh, playoff debut, which is, I think it's just Tyler Hero and Luka Doncic who have like 42 points above him. Actually, wait, no, I feel like it's first playoff run and not playoff debut because I'm pretty sure Tyler Hero didn't score 35 points. That was against the Celtics in like game five or game six or whatever. Um, but yeah, anyways, Anthony Edwards though, he was phenomenal. And so can Minnesota actually pull off the upset, right? Obviously the answer is they definitely can, um, but let's talk about some of the things that kind of go into this, right? So let's start off with um, Steven Adams, Memphis, the starting center, right? fantastic guy i love him right um but i just this might be a series in which memphis needs to bench him and of course he might save them in a a game or two later on so i might have to like eat my words but just watching this game he felt super ineffective and a sense that of like well defensively his biggest strength is protecting the rim right he's a very solid rim protector um he's not going to block a ton of shots but just a very smart defensive player Problem is, Minnesota, their whole thing is spacing, spacing, right? Carl Anthony Towns, probably the best three-point shooting center in NBA history, right? Um, one of the best shooting bigs of all time. He keeps drawing Steven Adams at the three-point line. And you can put him on, you know, Jared Vanderbilt if you want to, because he's also like a non-shooter. But um, Vanderbilt, he only played 18 minutes tonight. And a lot of those minutes were when Steven Adams wasn't in the game, right? So then you can maybe stick him on like Jaden McDaniels or Patrick Beverly even, like people who you just hope aren't making three-pointers, but when they're making threes like they were in the first half tonight, they were on fire, right? Then it's just, it's tough, man. Um, I'm not saying bench Steven Adams, of course, but I'm just saying this might be a series in which he's just not as effective. And the problem is, well, if he's not in the game for you, offensively, your offense also depends a lot on Adams, right? As an offensive screen setter and as a playmaker, because um, he's definitely taking on a really good uh, passing uh, role with the Grizzlies this year. Problem is, and okay, this is something that I really emphasized in my last Grizzlies talk and pretty much every single Grizzlies subject I've talked about on my podcast or on Instagram. I'm worried about this team's spacing. And tonight, that really, the worst of that kind of reared its ugly head, right? Where basically I was like, well, John Morant, right? He's an unstoppable freak of an athlete. He's going to be able to get to the rim whenever he wants to. And you can't really do anything about it if you're a defense unless you just pack the paint, which is pretty much what the Timberwolves did, right? Every single time John Morant got past the three-point line, they would bring in an extra defender to help out, right? And, you know, John, he would find the open shooters to his credit. But if you really think about it, and I said this like multiple times about the Grizzlies, um, especially in my last video about them, right? They really only have one above average shooter on the entire roster, and it's Desmond Bain. And he's great. He's like borderline elite, right? But aside from that, you have like what? Um, DeAnthony Melton, who's a good shooter, granted, right? Dylan Brooks, who's extremely inconsistent. Same as Jaron Jackson Jr. To his credit, though, Dylan Brooks, who was great tonight. Um, But, you know, Jaron Jackson Jr., though, he was 0 for 5. And I know I didn't make my X Factors videos for the Western Conference because, I'll be honest, I was planning to, but, you know, Friday night, I got kind of, you know, busy with uh, Friday night stuff. But the last time I talked about Jaron Jackson Jr. on my Instagram, my blog, whatever, right? I mentioned how I thought that he could be the X-Factor for the Grizzlies, and by the way, sorry if you can hear my roommate laughing in the background, he's um, playing video games. Um, But yeah, I mentioned how Jerry Jackson Jr. was going to be the X-Factor for this team, because this team, they need shooting, they need spacing, right? They need guys to hit open shots when teams are collapsing on John Moran. 
and today or yesterday if you're watching on Sunday, which you probably will be actually because I'm not releasing this until Sunday, Jaron Jackson Jr. did not hit his shots and neither did a lot of other Grizzlies. And Jackson, we know that theoretically he has the ability to shoot, right? His sophomore year in the league, he shot almost 40% from three on like six threes a game. But I um, mean, the last two years, last year gave him a pass because he was hurt for like 70 games, right? Um, this year though, he's played all season and he's shooting like 33% from three. I forgot, not a very high percent. I think lower than that actually, right? And today, you know, if he just makes like, let's say he just makes two of those, which okay, I say just two, but that's like 40%. Let's say he hits two of his threes, right? Memphis might actually pull this game out because they were in it till the very end and you know um, had to foul to you know close the game out the game was kind of over but basically if uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. or DeAnthony and Mountain right or like you know Kyle Anderson makes it another three or two this game might have been a different story. More importantly though I think that Memphis has to figure out how the hell they're going to stop Minnesota on offense and I can't believe it's taken me six minutes to get to this topic because this was pretty much a story of the night. And it was Anthony Edwards and um, Carl Anthony Towns pretty much just cooking Memphis, right? DeAndre Russell, he was awful in this game, shooting-wise, right? Like, but they just could not stop Anthony Edwards. And to be honest, like, I don't know how you do it because he was just doing superstar-type things in this game, right? He was making these really tough, hard-to-guard jumpers where ordinarily you're just like, okay, if Anthony Edwards has to settle for those shots, then, you know, sure, we'll give that to him, right? Like. If this possession ends on Anthony Edwards taking a contested 18-foot jumper with like four seconds left on the shot clock, then yeah, okay, that's you know we'll settle for that. Problem was Anthony Edwards, he was making those shots tonight, and you know based off what we saw in the playing game against the Clippers, it might seem like Anthony Edwards just might actually be that guy. And you know at that point, if you're the head coach, you're just kind of like, well, crap. Well, what do you do now, right? Because you know I'm not calling Anthony Edwards Kawhi or Kobe, for example, but like. It's kind of similar to that, right? Where they just, they make shots that are bad shots, but because they're so good, they're no longer bad shots. And Anthony Edwards actually had a great quote after the game where he was like, you know, Coach Jenkins, sorry, Coach um, Chris Finch, Coach Finch, geez, Chris Jenkins is, not even Chris Jenkins, that's a Villanova player. Um, man, I, uh, I really just lost track of what I was saying there. Uh, basically though, Anthony Edwards was just talking about how he's confident in his jumper. And it's true because when he's hitting like he was tonight, then yeah, uh, keep on shooting, right? There's not really a bad shot in that situation. And then it gets interesting because if you're, you know, the Memphis, how do you stop this, right? Because you had Dylan Brooks on Anthony Edwards most of the game. And Dylan Brooks, he's a great defender, right? The problem was their game plan, their scheme, defensive scheme, whatever, it requires Dylan Brooks to be like a help defender because, you know, it requires everyone to be a help defender, right? And you saw today because Minnesota, they have so many shooting weapons, in DeAndre Russell, Malik Beasley, Edwards, Crown Clay Towns, right? That four, that defense, they are stretched apart. And there are some possessions where Dylan Brooks, right? Like he was getting up decent contests on Anthony Edwards because he had to rotate over. But it's just Edwards was so hot that those decent contests were bad contests, right? And again, if Edwards is going to keep hitting like this, then man, it's going to be really hard to stop him because at that point you're kind of like, okay, well, if we have to double team Edwards, if Dylan Brooks, for example, has to stay glued to Edwards throughout every single screen, throughout off ball movement, right? So you can't really help off of him. Then, you know, that kind of screws with their whole game plan, right? Because he's, you know, this entire team, they have so many people who are so deadly attacking closeouts that like your defense is just really pulled apart, right? Like, you know, if you close out late on like Robert Covington, for example, right? What is he gonna do, you know? Um, Robert Covington, he's not gonna put the ball on the floor and make a play, right? With Anthony Edwards though, yeah, he's gonna, you know, dunk on you, right? Or DeAndre Russell, he won't dunk on you, but he's gonna make a play too. Malik Beasley even, he can put the ball on the floor too. He can dribble, right? If you, you know, have a bad closeout or it's just not like perfect, then yeah, Malik Beasley, he's gonna score. He's gonna make a play, right? So, and geez, that's really the problem with the Timberwolves. And I feel like we really underrated this problem as like, you know, fans and especially me, right? Because I understood that they had so many deadly offensive players and yet I still kind of overlooked them because it wasn't that I questioned their talent. I questioned their ability to actually show up in the playoffs, right? Because, you know, it's a whole different factor. But the thing is now the last two games, they have been showing up. Carl Anthony Towns didn't show up, you know, game one, of course, but you know, well, not game one, but the play-in game, is my point. But, you know, with Anthony Edwards playing so well in both these games, it's kind of like, well, okay, if this team plays at their best, all of a sudden, they're really freaking good. 
because I don't think anybody ever doubted the upside of Minnesota. I think pretty much everyone recognized that, okay, if Carl Anthony Towns is playing well, if Anthony Edwards is playing like the superstar, we know he can play like, right? If DeAndre Russell is, you know, um, hitting shots, being a good facilitator, Malik Beasley, he's going out there, Jared Vanderbilt, Jaden McDaniels, they're doing their thing, then yeah, Minnesota can be like, honestly, a really dark horse contender here, right? No one had any doubts about that. It was that us, we were doubting their floor. The fact that we didn't really trust them to actually show up every single game, right? Kind of like the Cincinnati Bengals almost in the last year's postseason run if you're an NFL fan, right? And um, here's the scary thing, right? These players, they're showing up. And if they're showing up, then, you know, they can really contend with everybody. And, you know, I have to admit that Minnesota, they were pretty hot in the first half, right? Like, I don't expect this to happen again, you know, for the rest of the seven games, although it could be. Um, but even so, like, okay, back to Jaron Jackson Jr. This is kind of like um, totally unrelated to the first point, I guess. He needs to keep his cool, right? Because offensively, he was struggling. But defensively, this is someone who Memphis fans were saying was a defensive player of the year all season, right? And tonight, he was, the lack of effort on that end was astounding. It's a playoffs game, right? And he was walking back on defense on some plays after, you know, missing a shot on offense. And that's just inexcusable. And I'm not calling him immature because, like, he is a grown man, of course, right? And he has way more pressure on him than I have ever had in my life, of course, right? So it's hard for me to be like, oh my god, Jaron Jackson Jr. needs to be more mature. But, like, he needs to keep his cool, right? Because, you know, that shove he had against, um, I think it was Jaden McDaniels after Conathane Towns dunked on him. You can't be doing that, right? It's a playoffs game. Your season's on the line. And by the way, um, I know John Morant wasn't exactly spectacular in the fourth quarter crunch time this game, but to be honest, like, I don't really blame him because I feel like he was doing his job, right? He was getting to the rim. He was drawing help defenders, right? He was making plays. He was scoring by himself too. You know, he had 27 points. Like, this isn't really his fault. His supporting cast, I'll be honest, they really just failed to step up, right? Because, I mean, Dylan Brooks, of course, he played great. 24 points, right? Also, um, shout out Desmond Bain. He had 17 points, but like everyone else was just not very good, right? And it's just disappointing because they miss a lot of shots that you need to make in a postseason game when you're wide open like that, right? And also like, don't pretend as if this was Minnesota playing at their very, very best and Memphis playing at their very worst. Because no, that's not the case, right? Minnesota, DeAndre Russell, he was awful tonight shooting wise, right? Like check the stats, okay? Um, he shot two for 11. So one of Minnesota's top three offensive players was terrible tonight, shooting-wise. This was not Minnesota at their very best, right? And that's pretty scary if you're a Grizzlies fan because um, it's not like they had a you know, really fluky game where they just played extremely well and you guys played very poorly. No, like they played well, but they just also straight up outplayed you. Like Minnesota, they didn't play at their very best. So like, yeah, um, honestly, in my opinion, this is a very evenly matched series, right? Like, I don't think there's a scenario in which Minnesota wins game one and then Memphis, like, wins the next four in a row. Like, no. I think the series is going seven games. Six games at the very minimum, right? Because so far, it's been very, very physical. And we've seen usually these physical, grinded out games tend to go the entire length, right? And it's kind of ironic saying that because the final score was 130 to 117. But just in terms of like, actual, like, physicality, um, you know, Crown Anthony Towns, he was... I don't want to hear people call him soft again. Actually, you know, maybe you can if he plays soft again, but tonight, he was not soft, right? He was bullying people. Memphis, one of the best rebounding teams in the entire league, was dominated on the glass tonight by the Timberwolves. And um, granted, Memphis, they haven't played basketball in like almost a week, right? Because you have to play in games on like Monday and Tuesday, I think, um, pretty early on. So like, you know, they're definitely probably rusty. So you have to account for that for sure without question, right? But however, that doesn't change the fact that the flaws that we all saw in Memphis's, you know, offense at, you know, the beginning of this playoffs basically kind of came to fruition against this game, in this game, right? And, you know, obviously I'm not saying it's over or Minnesota's going to upset them, of course, right? Like Memphis still very much has a really great chance of taking over and winning the series, right? But yeah, if Minnesota continues playing like this, they can easily beat Memphis, right? And even if Memphis is playing at their very best, Minnesota, they can still win because if they're playing at their very best, they're just as good, right? The whole argument for why we had Memphis over Minnesota was 
Memphis at a higher floor than Minnesota, right? We could trust the Grizzlies to play at a consistently higher level than Minnesota. But, you know, once again, if the Timberwolves are going to keep playing at their ceiling, like they have the last two games, then yeah, um, this is going to be tough.